Bible study. As you know, I am Shalom Dodi, and I'm glad to be here with all of you. I'm glad to see you. I welcome you. Christ fought, God is glorious, Hannah, lady, mom, uh, violinist, and I, in the name of Jesus. Our format is welcome, song, prayer, sharing, and closing. And the song is, you know, you know, the verse we've been using for the anchor verse that we started with is an anchor verse. <laughs> we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. And that's Jesus and his completed work on the Christ. And that is our hope. And that is the anchor for our soul. And this song is. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. And it and it mentions anchor. So listen for anchor. And when you're finished, type done.
Okay, I think we're done. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we set our hope afresh on you. Father, we thank you that your love, your provision, your gentleness, your kindness, and your compassion is an anchor for our souls. And that no matter what is going on in our lives or what isn't going in our, on in our lives that we wish was, you are the solid rock. So, Father, we bless you. In this day, we thank you for this time where we can simply gather around your word with you and with one another. Bless each one here and those we love. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I was thinking the other day, I don't remember which day, about tonight and about hope, and I read something, and I wanted to bring it um, to us, but first, we're all in a weird season, something none of us have ever experienced before, and it's all around the world. There's the COVID drama, and various governments are handling it in different ways, and even in the United States, it's being handled in different ways in different states. People, friends, good friends, <laughs> good friends have varying opinions on the COVID crisis drama. And we all here probably have opinions all over the spectrum on that topic, right? We're not going to express them tonight. Families have struggled. Friends have disagreed. Wise people, and I think the wisest people of all are the ones who have agreed to disagree and still love one another, right? And that's just one thing going on. And then, of course, it's been going on forever, it seems like. And then there is the election here in the United States and all the false news, which no one I know can actually sort out. And so mostly for me, I just try to tune it out. I don't think about it. And there are issues, government issues in Canada going on. There are no people in Canada who have that kind of drama going on. In uh, Wales and the United Kingdom, same thing, because I have friends over there. And I, and I talk to them sometimes, or I see what they put on Facebook. And so, yeah, there's political drama going on everywhere. It's sort of intertwined. And then... There are even issues, <laughs> interpersonal ones, in chat right here at the Four Gospels, as well as our interpersonal issues that are going on in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, in our churches. It's always something. People get sick. People struggle with health. People struggle with finances. People struggle with their emotions. You've all got your own list, I'm sure, of what you struggle with or the potential to struggle with or what someone close to you struggles with. But, and this is a big but, okay? There is one thing we all have in common. We know Jesus. We know Messiah. We know Savior. We know the Lord. We have the Word. We serve a God who is the Lord of hope, who understands our every need. And he is our Sar Shalom, too, our Prince of Peace. We are sons and we are daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we are dearly loved children, too. I was reading something online that I wanted to share, and I... I'm not sure if I got the link to it or not, but it's a public domain thing. Uh, and then after that, we're going to look at a few Bible verses on hope. And the author asked this question. Sort of sounds like me when I uh, begin one of my talks. 
the author says, Are you in the midst of a difficult time? Are you afraid you won't get through it? We all struggle with these feelings from time to time. We might fear, <laughs> sort of, we might fear that the depression will never leave or whatever, and the pain may never stop. Or when we're down in the pits, we wonder, will this gray sky ever brighten, this load ever lighten? We might be at times, and we see people come into the chat rooms asking these kind of questions too, don't we? We might even be asking, does God really care? Is he good? We may feel stuck. We may feel locked in, and we may feel trapped. We may feel, and I hope nobody here feels this way, but the author said sometimes people may feel predestined for failure. Will we ever exit this pit? And the Dodie note here. Remember, we've been talking about stories that we believe are true, but they're not the full truth. And some of them are not even partial truth. Do you ever have those stories like we just discussed? That sort of story try to attach to you and be your own story? Such as, I'm destined for failure. I'll never get out of this pit. This this will never go away. It'll never get better. I'm doomed. Yes. And you know what? Those are lies from the pit of hell. Because this is still the Doty note, okay? Yes, cast them down. We are survivors. And more than that, we are also overcomers. By the power of the blood of Christ, we are victors, not victims. We are more than conquerors, too, according to Romans 8. And this is where I got lost in the word. I want to start with the first part of Romans 8 and then skip to near the end. So we're starting at, we're just kind of reading this, okay? There is therefore... Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Verse 3 and 4. Isn't that a great passage? For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, not according to those stories either. Are we trapped? Stuck? This is a dodie note. Are we trapped? No. Struck? No. Without hope? No. God, who began a good work in each of us, is going to continue his work of transformation and restoration. <laughs> and continuing, skipping a few verses and then picking back up in uh, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, and Paul had some sufferings, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation 
but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies it's that place of already not yet it's a it's a holy it's a holy tension already yes but not yet completely and then in verse 24 it says in 25 For this, in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait, we wait, we wait for it with patience. And verse 26. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of god and then And we know, we know that for those who love God, that's us, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And Dodie note, is that good news? And is that the truth? Yes, it is good news. And yes, it is the truth. And yes, sometimes we need to remind ourselves what we know. But we forget. And then verse 31 starts the end of the passage. Let's see how am I going to divide it? What then shall we say to these things? If, and he is, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for each of us. In verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, those things we talked about before, or distress? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And then finally, verse 37 through 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you and me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Dodie note. 
Now, isn't that just rich in hope, all of that, in promise? Does your heart soar and your spirits lift as we read that passage? And we didn't read all of it. You can go back and pull the rest. Honestly, when I looked it up, (laughs) hey, Luana, I was only planning to bring the last three verses, but then I started reading it, and the rest of the chapter was so rich and so full of hope, so hope-inspiring that I just had to bring that too. And now, and um, and I pray, and my prayer for all of us is that we were uplifted by that portion of the word. And you know, the word that God has given us in the Bible, which is kind of a love letter and a direct, you know, how to live life letter. But the word, when you're really down, sometimes you can't even focus. But if you go and you just read the word, it will just lift you up. It'll draw you in. It'll enfold you and embrace you because it is his love that he's given us. Now, Max, and so this, now we're back to the article. That was all this long, Dodie note. The author, Max Lucado, you may or may not like him, but some of his stuff is great. He has something called a survivor's creed. And this article I read Um, is based on that. And it's kind of cool. We are more than survivors. We are conquerors. But the survivor's creed says, we'll get through this. It won't be painless. It might not be quick. But God is going to use this mess for good. Don't be foolish or naive, but don't despair either. With God's help, we'll get through this. We'll get through this. Isn't that kind of a neat reminder? And isn't that just grand? And he goes on to say, he breaks that down a bit. Uh, Yes, just like that. You fear you won't. We all do sometimes. We fear that the depression will never leave, the yelling will never stop, and the pain will never leave. Here in the pits, surrounded by steep walls and angry brothers or sisters, we wonder, will this gray sky ever brighten? Will this load ever lighten? We feel stuck, we feel trapped, and we feel locked in, predestined for failure. Will we ever exit this pit? Will COVID ever end? Will life ever be free like it was before? Will this election ever end? Or whatever government you're in, your government issues, will they ever end? Yes, they will. Deliverance, I love this, is to the Bible what jazz music is to Mardi Gras. It's bold, it's brassy, and it's everywhere. Yes, we are short-sighted in the pit. That's why we have to get into the back into the word if we're out of it. And then he and he breaks it down. And I really like this perspective. It won't be painless. Have you wept your final tear or received your last round of chemotherapy? Maybe not. Will your unhappy marriage become happy in a heartbeat? Not likely. Are you exempt from a trip to the cemetery? No. A little preemie I know died last night. Does God guarantee the absence of struggle and the abundance of strength? No, he doesn't. Not in this life. But he does pledge to reweave your pain for a higher purpose. Anybody who's been through, like violinist talks about his broken leg. And that was a very difficult season. It was really hard at the time. But it gives him a focal point to point to, yes, God brought me through. Yes, it was hard. And yes, it took a long time. But now look what he's doing. He's playing for us. He's leading that thing on Friday nights. So he does reweave our pain for a higher purpose. And then he said it won't be quick. And I love this reminder of Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers abandoned him. 
you know, threw him down that well or whatever they did and left him there to die. He at first they were going to and then they sold him to the slavers. But he was at least 37 before he saw them again. 17 to 37 at least. Another couple of years passed before he saw his father. <laughs> That's a good one, Milas. Sometimes God does take his time. His time, not our time. 120 years to prepare Noah for the flood. 80 years to prepare Moses for his work. And then after... He spent 80 years, he isolated him in Arabia for maybe three more years. Jesus himself was on the earth for three decades, about three decades before he built anything except maybe a kitchen table. And so how long will God take with us? He may take his time. His history is redeemed, not in minutes, but in lifetimes. And the other thing is said in the article, but God will use this mess for good. We see a perfect mess. God sees a perfect chance to train, test, and teach the future prime minister. We see a prison. God sees a kiln. We're on the potter's wheel. Yes, God uses even sin sinlessly. We see famine back in the Bible, and God sees the relocation of his chosen lineage. We call it Egypt. The Bible called it Egypt. God called it protective custody where the sons of Jacob can escape barbaric Canaan and multiply in peace. We see Satan's tricks and ploys. But God sees Satan tripped and foiled. Remember what I said before? It's the already, not yet. And that holy tension between it's already done. It was completed on the cross. But we're not yet in heaven. We're still here on earth. And then there was a warning. In that little poem. Don't be foolish. Or naive. Turbulent times will tempt you to forget God. Shortcuts will lure you. Sirens will call you. But don't be foolish or naive. Do what pleases God. Do nothing more and nothing less. And don't despair either. Each day has a pop quiz. <laughs> Some seasons are final exams. Brutal, sudden pitfalls of stress, sickness, or sadness. Like Joseph, you did your best. Like Joseph, your best was rewarded with uh, jail, incarcinate, being car incarcerated. But what is the purpose of the test? Oops. Uh-oh. I erased my notes. Hold on. Got him. What is the purpose of the test? Why didn't God keep Joseph out of prison? Might this be the answer from James, the book of James? I love the book of James. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character. And ready for anything. And that's New Living Translation. But that's okay for that. And wasn't that all just kind of a good reminder? It wasn't Bible verses. But it was a good reminder. And we are going to ponder a few verses together now. Romans 5, 2 through 5. These are verses about hope. Through him, Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And more than that, uh, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. 
and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. It's kind of a hard passage, but doesn't that go well with the James thing that we read in the New Living Translation just a minute ago about character? Godly character. Through him, Jesus, through salvation, by faith, we have been given grace in which we can stand during difficult times and we can rejoice in hope. And we can also rejoice, yes, rejoice in suffering. And that's hard, isn't it? But that is what Paul says. And he did do it. And so did Jesus. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. That joy was your salvation and mine and everyone else's. So in that passage that we just read, we see a progression. Suffering to endurance. Endurance to character, godly character. Character produces, do you see it? Hope. And hope does not put us to shame because we know we belong to God. There's a verse, I said these things that in you, you may, in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I love that passage too. And do you remember the ones of you that have been here? My personal definition of hope, what hope means to me, because I used to struggle with hope. It means (laughs) that no matter what happens or what does not happen, God is still, always and forever, Emmanuel, God with me and you. He will never, ever, no, never abandon us. His love is steadfast and endures forever. He is both Emmanuel and I am. I am is God's name that he gave himself, and it means everything, all we need, past, present, and future. And Emmanuel means God with us. It may be, if I remember, our next topic will be the steadfastness of God's love for us, because I love steadfastness. I love the word steadfast. Next scripture for tonight is one we read earlier in that longer passage. But if we hope, Romans 8, 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Donina, we were told about all the benefits of trials and struggles just a bit ago in Romans 5. And then in this, in this verse, we are reminded that even when we do not, quote, see God, even when we can't perceive that God is indeed with us, loving us with his steadfast love, we still choose to wait with patience. And yes, it does take God's grace. And we know, we all know the final outcome, at least for us. It's heaven. And Revelation 21, 4 says, speaking of heaven. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So, you know, it's just now dawning on me that maybe, in a sense, while we live on this fallen earth, before we, in in this already not yet place, this holy tension place that we live in, maybe it's not abnormal to have tears in our eyes sometimes and mourn. 
because it's the fallen world and we're not yet in heaven. And here's my doty note from Revelation 21 4. Do you ever wish that this could be complete right now? Wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Do you wish it could happen tonight in our daily lives? But it is a future hope that enables us to endure, and not just endure either, flourish. And again, we're reminded in 2 Corinthians, Four sixteen through 18 it says so we do not lose heart though our outer self is wasting away our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look <laughs> not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And isn't that just like I was reminded of um, Second Kings when Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. We don't see. We see through a mirror dimly right now on earth. These earth eyes. We can have them open more and more. The eyes of our spirit and our heart and our mind can be enlightened by the word of God and the truth of God and the Holy Spirit. But in Second Kings, he said, oh, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Remember that story? There is a hole. unseen spiritual realm which is i believe even more real than this physical realm we simply need to hope when there is no outward manifestation even if we're still sick even if we're still sad even if someone we love is struggling and the reason is because god is real he is good and he is always with us. He is Emmanuel. And one of my pastors likes to remind us all that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience on earth. We are not just physical beings sometimes having a spiritual experience. And I rather like that reminder. If you can wrap your head around that. We are a spirit. We are we have a spirit and we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit if we're born again. But um, this physical world, this time we have on earth, that's not the whole story. Our spirit will live forever. Thankfully, if we're born again, we're going to live forever in heaven with God. And what a glorious thing. But sometimes we forget what we know. Psalms is just chock full of examples. One is found in Psalm 71, 5, and the psalmist reminds himself, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. And this is true for us, too, you know. Even before we were aware of God, he knew us, because after all, he was knitting us in our mother's wombs. And you know, little children seem to just have an innate knowing that God is real. They lose it much more quickly now than they used to from TV, I think. But, oh, Lord, you are our hope, our trust, oh, Lord, from our youth. And Titus has a big hope in it. Titus 3, 7. <laughs> it's an eternal hope reminder. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life with God. 
And I love, 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 love Isaiah 41.10. It says, Fear, yeah, I know. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Violinist, just so much your turn. Dodie note, what a promise for them and what a promise for us. What parent wants their little child to fail? None. And what good parent will not try to help their little child? God is not just our good father. He's our perfect father. And he will always be Emmanuel. As this verse says, he will help us. He will strengthen us. And he will uphold us. Of course, that's when we're not too busy pitching a little toddler fit and saying, I can do it by myself. I don't need your help, God. Guess what? Often we can't. 90% of the time we can't, even when we think we can. And we never, ever have to do this thing called life alone. So, Father, we bless you in this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your um, good and perfect will for our lives. And um, I would like to just close with thanking you, Lord, for the truth that's found in Zephaniah 317. And Father, I ask that this um, <laughs> this be our, our, um, our go-to verse when we feel alone, abandoned, overwhelmed. Zephaniah 317 says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. And look, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to I want to tell you one thing. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about the goodness of God and the benefits of God. And I don't spend a lot of time talking about our part in repentance. But I think that that we know that God is holy and God is good. And he is so holy that the only way we can come before him is because we are in Christ. And yes, we ask God to search our hearts. Yes, we repent when we sin. We keep short tabs on that. We forgive others when they sin against us. But I like to spend time focusing on who God is because so many people in this world haven't got a clue about who God is. They know that their father did this or their uncle did that or their mother did that or their father did not do this and their relatives did not do that. And they put that picture, that story, as you, as it were, of not such a good father or not such good other authority figures on God. And that's not who God is. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's righteous. Yes, he's just. Yes, he judges. But he's good and he's loving and he's compassionate. And over and over it says he's slow to anger and abounding in love. So I don't want to be out of balance. Yes, we repent. That's so important. In fact, we have to do that to be, quote, in Christ. Okay? So I just wanted to say that. And now I'm turning it over to Violinist to play for us. Can everybody hear me? My instrument right here. Feel free to type in your requests and I'll try my best to fulfill them.
Thank you, and everyone have a great evening. And tomorrow night is Quorum Deo. Wednesday night is Romans.